Romans chapter 9, the title of this morning's message is The Alarm is Sounding. The alarm is sounding. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you use alarms? All right. How many of you hit the snooze button so that you can get some extra sleep? Oh, my gosh. We're all snoozers around here. <laughs> well, as you and I know, an alarm refers to a signal that is meant to rouse, awaken, or alert. That's what an alarm is supposed to do, right? It awakens, it alerts, or it rouses us out of our sleep because we've been snoozing throughout the night. Did you know that we have a built-in device that tells us the difference between what is right and what is wrong? It alerts us to what is good and to what is bad. How many of you know what it's called? Exactly. It's called the conscience. And Paul mentions that in Romans chapter 9. We'll look at that in a moment. Let's read Romans 9 in our real life news series through the book of Romans beginning in verse 1. Paul speaking to the Roman church, to the brothers in Christ. He says in verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God or the worship to God, and the promises, verse 5, of whom are the fathers from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. And then he punctuates it with saying, Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you have already done. Thank you, Lord, that we can sing hallelujah. And we sing that, Lord God, with our hearts in an upright position because we serve a God who is on the throne. And we worship you, Lord God. As we take time out in this Sunday morning, Lord, to hear from your word, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be set in right order, that, God, we would be ready to hear with our ears because the Bible tells us often to hear with our ears. And the Spirit is speaking to us, the church. And so he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to us. The church, not the building, but the body of Christ, a group of believers. Lord, let us not only hear it, but then, Lord God, let us do it. Let us apply these truths to our own lives individually and Lord give us the strength and the power by your Holy Spirit to take these truths to a world that needs to know that there is a real life God who's changing lives and his name is Jesus Christ and so Lord God we now tune in to what you have for us through the Holy Spirit in Jesus name amen notice back in verse 1, Paul mentions his conscience. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. The Greek word uh, translated conscience in all the New Testament references is son of decess. Son of decess. And what it means is moral awareness or moral consciousness. The conscience is to our souls what pain sensors are to our bodies. It inflicts distress in the form of guilt. In other words, his conscience is guilty. Whenever we violate what our hearts tells us is right. So Paul, he talks about the conscience. And if you notice in his writing, he mentions it often. And in verse 1, 
He says, with Christ as my witness, I speak the truth in Christ. And he says, my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. And so the New Testament has a lot to say about the conscience. Here are just a few verses. 1 Timothy 1.5, Paul writing to Timothy, he says, love from a good conscience. Acts 23 verse 1, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Acts 24, 16, I myself always strive to have a good con conscience without offense toward God and man. And then 2 Timothy 1, 3, I serve with a pure conscience. I serve with a pure conscience. And then in John chapter 8, there is a story of a woman who was caught in the, in the act of adultery by a, by a group of men. It was religious men, the scribes and the Pharisees. They caught this woman in adultery, and the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious guys of the day, they brought this woman to Jesus. And the Bible says that when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. So now you have this, this scene being painted. These Pharisees, they caught this woman in the, in the uh, act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus. They set her in the midst. And then they remind Jesus of what Moses' law had said. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. What did Jesus do? He stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Can you imagine? Here's Jesus. He stooped down. He's now on the ground and he's writing something with his finger and as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him stone, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, notice this in John 8, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I love how this whole scene plays out and the verse that caught my attention this week was where then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience they were they were convicted by their conscience and Jesus didn't really say anything he had stooped down remember and he was using his finger to write something in the dirt and they were convicted and they went out one by one from the oldest to the youngest, and then Jesus said to this woman, where are your accusers? Has anyone condemned you? She said, no. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We have this, this conscience that bears witness. We have this alarm system within us that alerts us to what is right and to what is wrong. And God has given us a conscience. And we know when we're telling the truth. We know when we're lying. No one even has to tell you, hey, you just said a little white lie. Because that conscience that God has placed within you alerts you to the fact that you just lied. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit convicts you. So God has given us a, a conscience and our conscience can be good or our conscience can be bad. And Paul, he mentions it time and time again. He says, I serve with a pure 
conscience, with a good conscience. And the conscience of these men convicted them to the point to where they got up and they left one by one because they knew that what they were doing in trying to get Jesus to stone her to death, they knew in their own conscience that they were wrong for what they had been doing. Obviously, they caught her in the very act. So obviously, they were watching something that they shouldn't have been watching. And then they brought her to Jesus to test him, to see how they can find accusation against him. So we have this conscience that alerts us on the inside. And it goes off like an alarm. Paul said in verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ Jesus. And why was he telling the truth in Christ Jesus? Well, because the truth of Jesus had set him free. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He says, I tell the truth and I am not lying and my conscience confirms that I am telling the truth because I know when I'm telling the truth. Not only does my conscience confirm that, but also so, so does the Holy Spirit confirm that I'm telling the truth. I wonder why he was telling them that he had to tell the truth. Could it be that maybe they thought he was lying? Paul reminds them, I tell the truth in Christ. There's no better way to tell the truth than to tell the truth in Christ. Did you know that we are to be truth tellers? Truth tellers. We are to tell the truth. The Bible says to speak the truth in love. Paul told the Ephesians, speak the truth in love. He also told the Ephesians, put off lying. Don't lie to one another. Instead, speak the truth. Put on the truth. How many of you have told a little white lie before? That's what I thought. My hand's up too. Right after you told that little white lie, you knew it, right? Did that guy tell you, hey, you're lying? No, because he didn't know you were lying. But you knew. Your conscience alerted you to the fact that you just told a little white lie. You know, kind of like that fish story. You know, you went fishing the other day. And then you came back home and your friend asked you, Man, how was the fishing? You're like, oh, man, it was good. Did you catch a big one? Oh, yeah, I caught a real big one. Well, how big was it? Uh, I think it was probably at least 48 inches. That uh, was more like four inches. You just stretched the truth. <laughs> Why? So that the guy could think that you're a really good fisherman. So you stretched the truth. You told a little white lie. And a lot of times we tell lies because we want people to look at us in a different light. We want them to think that, man, I really am a good fisherman. Wow, well, how did you catch such a big fish? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you the story. I had to do this and that and everything else, and one thing leads to another. The Bible says we are to be truth tellers. We are to speak the truth in love. And Paul, he's reminding the believers who he was telling the truth in. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. Christ is in me. Therefore, since Christ is in me, I am going to tell the truth because Christ compels me to tell the truth. Isn't that good? Christ compels you and me to tell the truth even when it what? Hurts. Even when it hurts. And so we're to be truth tellers. We are to speak the truth in love. And when we speak the truth, did you know that gives us, it gives us peace of mind? When we speak the truth, doesn't it give us peace of mind? You have peace. But when you decide to tell a lie, do you have peace of mind? You don't have peace of mind. And your conscience is, is alerting you to the fact that you just lied and the Holy Spirit convicts you that you just lied but when we speak the truth it gives us peace of mind and did you know that telling the truth changes people telling the truth changes people i'm so glad that when i received christ back in 94 
November of 94. I'm so glad that when that pastor got up and spoke on that Sunday evening, I'm so glad that he spoke the truth, and I'm so glad that he called sin what it was. And I'm so glad that he said, if you're a sinner separated from Christ, and if you've never come to faith in Christ because your sin has separated you from Jesus Christ, then stand up and come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm glad that he told the truth because the Holy Spirit convicted me of, of the sin that I was in. And I came forward as a result, and God changed me. And so it's so important to speak the truth, to be truth tellers because the truth changes people's lives just like the woman who was caught in adultery her life was changed what did what did jesus say to her go and sin no more you're not condemned but go and sin no more in other words Quit this lifestyle that you have been living in. You have been committing adultery, sleeping around with married men. Stop. You're in sin. Go and sin no more. Not that she was going to go out and not fall short of the glory of God and not sin anymore. But Jesus told her, go and sin no more. In other words, you are now no longer to practice this lifestyle of sin that you have been in. Aren't you glad for the grace and truth of Jesus Christ? Jesus could have condemned her, right? And isn't that what the men who were convicted by their conscience wanted? They wanted Jesus to condemn her. It, didn't the law say that she should be stoned with rocks? Jesus, pick up a stone, stone her, kill her for what she was doing. And Jesus, where are your accusers? They just split, they're gone. They were convicted by their conscience. They're out. Where are the accusers? I don't condemn you, but because of grace and truth, go and sin no more. God gives us grace and truth. And when we tell the truth, it changes people. And Jesus told her the truth. Go and sin no more. Telling the truth also earns respect. Because telling the truth shows that you really care for others. Did you know that? That telling the truth earns respect because it really shows that you care for others. If we don't care for people, then we aren't going to tell them the truth, right? But because we care for them, we'll tell them the truth and we'll, we'll tell them things like, you know what, man, you're really headed down the wrong path. If you don't get right with Jesus Christ, and you don't change your evil ways, your marriage is going to suffer. And eventually, if you don't change your evil ways, your marriage is going to begin to crumble because you're not willing to recognize your sin. And when we tell the truth, it, it earns respect because I really think it shows people that we care for them. And if we care for them, we're going to tell them the truth, right? Now, we don't like to always hear the truth, right? Because the truth doesn't always feel good, right? And, and it hurts when we're being told the truth. But it's, if God didn't love us, God wouldn't tell us the truth. But God cares for us so much that he tells us the truth. And so Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ. Now, we know what the context is, is all about, and we'll get more into it uh, later in Romans 9. We'll see how all the context of this comes together. But the principle here is that we are to be truth-tellers. If we aren't truth-tellers and if we're lying, our conscience will confirm to us that we are lying and the Holy Spirit will convict us of that sin. You can't lie if you're telling the truth, right? Right? You can't lie if you're telling the truth. How can you do both at the same time? You can't. The Bible says, put away lying and let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we are members of one another. So our conscience and the Holy Spirit will confirm when we are telling the truth or when we are lying. And that's what Paul is saying in verse 1. My conscience confirms 
And the Holy Spirit confirms that I am tallying the truth in Christ Jesus and I am not lying. And then what does he go on to say next? Well, Paul shares his heart for the people. We see Paul's heart in verses 2 and 3. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Notice Paul's heart. And he wears his heart on, on, on his sleeve, right? We've heard that phrase before. Or we've said it. Man, that guy wears his heart on his sleeve. Paul says, I have great sorrow and I have continual grief in my heart. Why does Paul feel this? Well, because his people were lost and because they were separated from the love of God. We just finished that glorious chapter in Romans chapter 8, like a mountaintop. It was like being at the, the pinnacle, if you will. It was like being at the top of the top. Romans chapter 8. Wow, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We have the Spirit living inside of us, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he's living inside of us. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Wow, what a beautiful mountaintop we were just on in Romans chapter 8. And now Paul, he just dives down. And he's, and he, he, he's going like down into the depths. And he's saying... Gosh, my heart is full of sorrow and I'm grieving. I wish that I myself were a curse from Christ so that my brethren could have what I have. Paul spoke his heart because his people were lost and they were separated. What did Paul want? He wanted the people, the Jews, to have what he had. In fact, notice Romans 10.1. Check out Paul. In Romans 10, 1. And look at, he continues to share his heart. He said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He had great sorrow and continual grief because the Israelites, they were separated from the love of God, which was in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they hadn't come to faith in God. They hadn't put their faith in God. And yes, they had all these pedigrees we'll look at in just a moment. They had all these things that God had given them, adoption, inheritance, the glory of God. Their forefathers saw the glory of God. The promises that God had given to the nation of Israel. The covenants that he had made. They had all those things. And yet, they hadn't put their faith in Christ. And he's grieving and he's sorrowful in his heart for the lost. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said this. This great passion for, soul, for souls gave Paul perspective. This great passion for souls gave Paul perspective. And he went on to say, lesser things did not trouble him because he was troubled by a great thing, the souls of men. Charles Spurgeon went on to say, get love for the souls of men. Then you will not be whining about the little disturbances. You will be delivered from petty worries and petty things if you are concerned about the souls of men. And then he said this, get your soul full of a great grief and your little griefs will be driven out. Paul sorrowed and grieved for the lost. He said, I have great sorrow and I have continual grief in my heart, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel that they may be saved. Wow. May we have a heart for the lost. I 
it just blows me away when I read about Paul's heart and I pray, Lord God, give me that kind of heart. Let me be a weeper, Lord, for the souls that are lost. And it was D.L. Moody who said, if we want to be winners of souls, we have to first become weepers of souls. We have to weep for the lost. And man, I'm not there yet, but I'm praying God that gives me a greater heart and, and that I would have that kind of sorrow for the lost like Paul had. What an amazing man of God he was. And he, he looked at his countrymen, he looked at the Israelites, and he saw how lost they were and, and how they had rejected Jesus Christ. They were the ones that, that hung Jesus Christ on the cross. They were the ones at the current writing of Romans, the book of Romans, they were the ones who were persecuting Paul and other Christians for their faith in Christ. They were religious. They were the Pharisees. And, and they thought that they were actually doing God a service when in reality they were doing God a disservice. Kind of like what Paul was doing. Remember him? He was a religious zealot. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the law backwards and forward. He knew every jot and every tittle of the law. And yet he was killing God's people. He was having them put in prison for their faith in Jesus Christ. And here he is now on the other side of that. He's saved, born again, a believer in Jesus Christ. And his heart breaks for the lost. May we pray for God to give us that kind of heart for the lost, the broken, and the marginalized. Paul went on to say in verse 3, For I, I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, from my countrymen according to the flesh. In other words, if it were possible, God, I would give up my salvation. I would give up my spot in heaven so that they could be saved. He even went as far as saying that, if it were possible... For I could wish that I myself were accursed. If it were possible, we know that it wasn't possible for, for Paul to give up his salvation or his spot in heaven for somebody else. But if it were possible, I would be willing to go that far, he said. You know, some of you know what I'm talking about. You've lost loved ones. I was thinking about it this morning. I remember it's just like yesterday, still so fresh when my mom passed away a little over a year ago. I remember you know, towards the end, my dad crying out and saying, Lord, if it's possible, take me and leave my wife. And he meant it. Lord, if it's possible, take me, Lord God, and, and heal my wife and leave her here. That's kind of the heart of Paul. Lord, if it's possible, I'm willing to give up my spot in heaven so that all these people could go to faith in Christ. Wow. What an amazing heart. He loved people deeply. And he cared about the souls of humanity. Moses reflects the same heart in the book of Exodus. It says, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. But, Jen, but check this out by Moses, what he says. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, Erase my name from the record you have written. Moses reflects the same heart. Way back when that Moses or that Paul is reflecting here. Lord, forgive their sin. But if not, erase my name from the record you have written. The measure of love in Moses and Paul for the people is mind-blowing. May God give us that kind of love and heart for people. Paul realized what business he was in. And what business was he in? He was in, peop in the people business. And that's what ministry is all about, right? It's about people. If there are no people, there is no ministry. We are in the people business. And as in the people business, we're also in the lost business. God has called us to go out and reach the lost. One by one. Or 
however God would see fit. But we are in that business. We are in the people business. And in the people business, guess what? Things get messy. And our lives are messy at times. And in the people business, other lives are messy. So do we say to those messy lives, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with your, your messy life. I'm disconnecting from your messy life. No, as Christians, we're, we run to the mess, right? We're like firemen. We run to the fire. Firemen run to the fire. What do we do? We run to the mess. And even if we're messed up, we still run to the mess and we try to help clean up the mess because we're in the people business. We're not in the business for ourselves. It's not a, a, a business where we profit. It's a, a, a nonprofit business, the people business. And we're called to minister to the people. And man, may God give us just his heart for the people. May we have the heart of, of Jesus. May we have the heart of Paul. Because the reality is Paul had whose heart? He had the heart of Jesus. Jesus had the heart for the marginalized, for the broken. Jesus came to seek and save those which were lost. Jesus went to the adulterous woman. Jesus went to the prostitute. Jesus went to the demon-possessed. Jesus went to the lepers who were marginalized, who were kicked out of their, their communities and who were put you know, behind chain fences, if you will. And society said, keep the... The lepers over there, please don't allow them to come into our community because we might get their cooties, you know? Jesus went to those kinds of people because Jesus was in the people business. That's what we do in the church. We're in the people business. We're, we're called to love people. And we're called to, to weep with people. And we're called to re rejoice with people. We're called to, to minister to people. And even in our messes, God still uses us to help clean, clean, clean up other people's messes. Aren't you glad that God uses flawed people? God uses flawed people. I mean, you go back to the beginning of time. God uses flawed people. His disciples didn't have it all together. Right? Weren't they arguing with one another? Hey, I'm the greatest. No, dude, I'm the greatest. I'm sorry, but you're not the greatest. You always say things out of order. No, I'm, I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to sit next to him. And God used those flawed men to turn the world upside down. God used Isaiah, who was flawed. He said, Lord, here am I. Well, right before he said that, he realized who he was in light of who God was. He said, I'm a man who is undone. I don't have it all together. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among the people who have unclean lips. But Lord, uh, if you want to use me, I'm flawed. I don't have it all together, but I'll raise my hand still anyways. God said, bingo, B-I-N-G-O, go. You know, go. Right after B-I-N, you know, go. You hit the bingo, now go. And we don't want to hit the bingo at the casino, but God chooses flawed people. And Paul had a heart for people. And he says, if I could, I would give up my spot in heaven. But he couldn't because his salvation was secure in Christ. But he shares his heart with us. Why? Because he loved people deeply. Because he cared for them deeply. My friends, people don't care how much we know until they see how much we care. And Paul had that kind of heart. And then in verses 4 through 5, he tells us how God blessed the Israelites with all the privileges of being his own special people. Let's read those verses again. Who are Israelites, verse 4, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. So he now, after sharing his heart, he was broken over those who were separated from Christ. He grieved his heart. It broke his heart. He had the heart of Jesus. Jesus wept for his people, remember? 
Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how I longed, how I longed to be with you, but you were not willing. Jesus wept for his people. He, were, he was broken, and, and Paul was grieving in his heart continually. He had great sorrow, shares his heart with us, and then he tells us just how blessed the Israelites were. God had blessed the Israelites with all the privileges of being his own special people. In other words, the Israelites had it made, and yet they squandered what God had richly blessed their forefathers with. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you go back and you look at what God had blessed their forefathers with, amazing, he gives us just a glimpse here, just kind of like our forefathers. We just celebrated Independence Day. Our forefathers who established this country, man, they, they founded it upon the rock, Jesus Christ. Our country was founded upon the word of God, was founded upon prayer. And as a result, the nation for the last 243 years, we've seen the blessings of the Lord. But now, here we are 243 years later, because we just celebrated America's birthday, here we are 243 years later, and we're squandering. We're squandering. We're not taking into consideration all that God blessed this country with. This country has not been blessed because of men or women. This country has been blessed because of God and because God was once over our nation. But now we're squandering all that, kind of like what the Israelites did. They had all the privileges. They had it made. God had said to them, you will be my people, and I will be your God. God ad adopted them as his family. God said that to the nation of Israel. You will be my people, and I will be your God. He adopted them as his family. And Paul, he says, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption? God adopted them as his family. He said, you will be my people and I will be your God. And when this was written 2,000 years ago in first century, most of them had forsaken the Lord. And Paul's reminding them of the special privileges. And then he reminds them that they had the presence of God who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the glory. God adopted them as his family and then belonged to them the glory. Or it also speaks of the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 40, it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting, because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. In other words, they had the Shekinah glory. They had the presence of Almighty God. God had blessed them with his glory, with his presence, his, his people. They had experienced the, the Shekinah glory, the cloud, the glory of God, the presence of God was evident. And so he's reminding them, man, your forefathers, here's what they, what they experienced. They were adopted as God's family. They experienced the glory of God. And my heart goes out to you. My heart's broken because you aren't experiencing what God has for you. You had 
the, your forefathers had the glory of God. And then he made covenants with them. The covenants, verse 4, the adoption, the glory, and then the covenants. God made covenants with the nation of Israel. He made the covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God said these words. Here's what God said. Blessing I will bless you. And multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. The covenants. I will bless you. And I will multiply you. And I will provide for you. I will give your descendants the gate of their enemies. And the covenants, I will bless you. And I will multiply you. They had it made. And then he also said the service of God. So we have the, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. God gave them the law to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, and soul. And then God gave them the service of God. In other words, he gave them the privilege of worshiping him. He gave them the pri privilege of worshiping him. That's what it's talking about here, the service of God. If you come on Wednesday nights, we just started the book of Exodus, you will see a lot of these things that are mentioned here. You will see them being unfolded and how God gave his people these blessings. And then he gave them the wonderful promises mentioned there of whom are the fathers and who were the fathers who are the patriarchs Abraham Isaac and Jacob Abraham Isaac and Jacob are their ancestors and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned verse 5 of whom are the fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob and from whom according to the flesh Christ came Christ himself was an Israelite as far as the human nature is concerned. Cain, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Now, for this particular verse, it's translated literally from the Greek. And here is how this verse should be translated it, when it is literally translated from the Greek. It, it's, it, it goes this way. It declares this. And of whom, as of concerning the flesh... Christ came, who is God over all, blessed forever. So the Greek translation is translated like this, of whom as of concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is God over all, blessed forever. So the declaration that Jesus is indeed God over all. Blessed forever. Get you a linear uh, tool. And, and you'll, when you read the linear, the, or when you read the Greek, it, it, translate, it translates it for you. And it's translated of whom as of concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is God over all. So Jesus Christ is who? He is God. Jesus Christ is God. And he is over all, and he's blessed forever. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is God and that he's over all? He is over all. God is in control. He is over all, and he's blessed forever, or as it says here, eternally blessed. He's the eternally blessed God. Christ is the eternally blessed God. And then he closes out with that word, amen. Amen. What does amen mean? So be it. Or let it be. Let it be. Let it be. So anytime you close out your prayer and you're saying, God, oh, change me. Lord God, work through me. And then you say amen. Here's what you're saying. You're saying, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. So remember that from now going forward. Every time you close out prayer and you say amen, you're telling God, let it be. When you say, God, use me to reach the lost, 
In Jesus' name, amen. You're just saying, okay, now it's time to go. Let it be. Let it be. God is over all, and he's blessed forever. So, Paul, he opened up by reminding us of his conscience and of the Holy Spirit. And I ask this question, is your conscience clear? You have a clear conscience. Is your conscience pl uh, pure? Do you have a, a good conscience? If not, then ask the, Lord to, ask the Lord to cleanse you. Secondly, do you have a heart for people? You have a heart for people. Paul had a heart for people. As Christians, we are to have a heart for people. You might be sitting here and you might be thinking, I really don't have a heart for people. And you might be thinking, okay, but I want a heart for people. How do I get a heart for people? Here's the best way to get a heart for people. Is spend time with Jesus. And you will get the heart of Jesus. Because as you spend time with Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, here's what you're going to see over and over again. You're going to see the heart of Jesus. And what kind of heart did Jesus have? He had a heart for people. He loved people. He cared for people. He was compassionate. He reached out to people. He even went to those whom society said, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with them. They're marginalized. They're not, they're not worth my time. They're not worth my effort. They're way too far gone. I don't want to get caught up in those, those messes because then I'm going to be drug into that mess. No, Jesus went to where the people were at. And as believers, we're to have a heart for people. And so the question is, do you have a heart for people? Thirdly, God has blessed you. If you're a Christian, the Bible says that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The Bible says that you are rich in grace. The Bible says that you are rich in mercy. The Bible says that God has given you gifts that are, irre that are irrevocable. And so my question to you is, are you wasting what God has blessed you with? The Israelites were wasting it. Are you wasting what God has blessed you with? And then finally, is Jesus the Lord over your life? Is he the Lord over all? If he is, you can say amen. If not, you can't say amen. But if he is, you can say amen. And if he isn't, you can come to faith in Jesus Christ and you can give him your heart. And allow him to be the Lord over all. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for these beautiful verses that you pen through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that they are verses that change our hearts. The truth changes our lives. The truth speaks to those hidden caverns deep within that no one can see. God, you know our conscience. You know, Lord God, where we're at. And I pray, Father God, that today, before we take communion, before we remember the Lord's Supper, and what, what, before we remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago, Lord God, I pray that if there are those among us who need to return back to their first love because they have left you and, and they're squandering, they're wasting all the blessings that you've given them. Or for those, Lord God, who need to make a new commitment to Christ, they need to turn from their sins and, and be born again from above. Then you simply raise your hand in whatever camp you're in and I'll acknowledge you and then I'll lead you in a word of prayer to come back to your first love or to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior for the first time. If that's you, raise your hand. And I'll lead you in a prayer. Because we're going to take communion. And communion is for the body of believers. It's not for, for those who don't know Jesus Christ. But you can come to know Jesus Christ and then take communion. Communion is, is a reminder of what the Lord did for us 2,000 years ago. And how he died for us on the cross. So is there anyone in here at all who would say, I want to make it right with Christ? Father God, I thank you for the hand that went up. 
Lord God, in the quietness, Lord God, of, of his heart, as we get ready to take communion, Lord, I pray that he would position his heart in the right position and that he would, God, come clean with whatever it is he needs to come clean with. And for us, Lord God, who are believers, I pray, God, before we take communion in this time of worship, that, God, we would confess whatever it is that we need to confess. Lord God, if our conscience isn't clear because of how we've been treating people or things that aren't right, God, I pray that we would confess that sin so we could have a clear conscience. God, I pray that if our hearts, Lord God, have, have gotten cold or callous because of what people have done to us or because how they have hurt us, I pray, God, that we'd come back to the heart of Jesus and that, God, we would have a heart like Paul the Apostle, that we would, we would grieve over the lost, that, God, we would be broken over our families and over our, our friends and our neighbors, that we would have more of this kind of heart. I know I need that kind of heart, Lord. And I pray, God, that we wouldn't squander, God, the blessings that you have given us, that, God, we would lean into them, we would be passionate about them and God I pray even that for us as believers Lord if you are not the Lord over all over everything God before we take communion I pray that God we would we would surrender everything we'd lay everything down at the foot of the cross and that God we would say Lord we I want you to be Lord over all and that we would close out with that prayer in our heart by saying amen let it be let it be.